is Pastor Suk. Pleasure to be able to be here to worship with you once again on Good Friday, which is one of my favorite services to always be a part of. Um, Good Friday, you see we have dimmed the lights a little bit. We have made things a little bit more somber as we remember the service of remembrance of the cross. It is a reminder for all of us of the cost of our sin, our Lord's death. It's also a reminder of how much our Lord truly loves us, our Lord's death. We enter the service in silence because this, this is really a continuation of what we started on Monday, Thursday. We will also exit the service in silence because every Lenten season always ends with an Easter. It doesn't end with the cross, it ends with an empty tomb. Our whole order of service is printed for you in the service folder. It will also be projected on the screen. And we will begin with our opening hymn found in the blue hymnals, The Power of the Cross, hymn 423.
Please stand. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Our help is in the name of the Lord. The of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins to God and ask for his forgiveness. Almighty God, merciful Father, I confess to you that I have not loved you with all my heart. In what I have done and left undone, I have pursued my ways instead of your ways. I have not loved others as you command. For this I deserve your punishment, now and forever. I am sorry for my sins. I repent of them. I beg for your mercy. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. Amen. You may be seated. We will continue with a series of scripture readings to remind us of the need of why we needed Jesus to be our Savior. And in our with these readings, we'll sing one stanza from Lamb of God, Pure and Holy, hymn 947. Our first reading from Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. You were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you formerly walked when you followed the ways of this present world. You were following the ruler of the domain of the air, the spirit now at work in the people who disobey. Formerly, we all lived among them in the passions of our sinful flesh, as we carried out the desires of the sinful flesh and its thoughts. Like all the others, we were by nature objects of God's wrath. A reading from Galatians 3, verse 10. In fact, those who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law.
our reading from James chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded people. Lament, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be changed into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Let us pray. God most holy, look with mercy on this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, be given over into the hands of the wicked, and suffer death upon the cross. Keep us always faithful to him, our only Savior, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading for Good Friday, part of this will serve as our sermon text from Isaiah chapter 52, beginning at verse 13. This is the Lord's will to sacrifice his servant so that we might be justified. We hear. Look. My servant will succeed. He will rise. He will be lifted up. He will be highly exalted. Just as many were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured that he did not look like a man, and his form was disfigured more than any other person. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him, because they will see something they had never been told before, and they will understand something they had never heard before. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root from dry ground. He had no attractiveness and no majesty. When we saw him, nothing about his appearance made us desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man who knew grief, who was well acquainted with suffering. Like someone whom people cannot bear to look at, he was despised and we thought nothing of him. Surely he was taking up our our weaknesses and he was carrying our sufferings. We thought it was because of God that he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted. But it was because of our rebellion that he was pierced. He was crushed for the guilt our sins deserved. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all have gone astray like sheep. Each of us has turned to his own way but the Lord has charged all our guilt to him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb he was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent in front of its shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away without a fair trial and without justice, 
and of his generation. Who even cared? So he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of the rebellion of my people. They would have assigned him a grave with the wicked, but he was given a grave with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, and no deceit was in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to allow him to suffer. Because you made his life a guilt offering, he will see offspring. He will prolong his days, and the Lord's gracious plan will succeed in his hand. After his soul experiences anguish, he will see the light of life. He will provide satisfaction. Through their knowledge of him, my just servant will justify the many, for he himself carried their guilt. Therefore, I will give him an allotment among the great, and with the strong he will share plunder, because he poured out his life to death, and he let himself be counted with rebellious sinners. He himself carried the sin of many, and he intercedes for the rebels. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with the psalm. Just one note before our next reading. The congregation will stand after the solo for the gospel. 
our second reading from Hebrews 7, 26 to 28. A reminder, Jesus is a superior high priest, for he offered a vastly superior sacrifice. This is certainly the kind of high priest we need. One who is holy, innocent, pure, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices on a daily basis, first for his own sins and then for the sins of people. In fact, he sacrificed for sins once and for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the law, appointed the Son, who has been brought to his goal forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The Gospel appointed for Good Friday, John chapter 19, verses 17 to 30. Jesus is sacrificed on the cross. 
carrying his own cross, he went out to what is called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had a notice prepared and fastened on the cross. It read, Jesus, the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this notice because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier. They also took his tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it. Instead, let's cast lots to see who gets it. This was so that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So the soldiers did these things. Jesus' mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene were standing near the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that time, this disciple took her into his own home. After this, knowing that everything had now been finished and to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there. So they put a sponge soaked in sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then, bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. You can be seated for the hymn of the day.
Again, my name is Pastor Souk. I serve over at Luther Prep in Watertown, Wisconsin. I serve in the Latin German department. And actually, this last hymn we sang, my students and I were learning this in German right now. So I actually started singing it in German initially. But the words for our focus today for our sermon, Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6. You can find it on page 6. I'll read just those three verses once again. Surely he was taking up our weaknesses, and he was carrying our sufferings. We thought it was because of God that he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted. But it was because of our rebellion that he was pierced. He was crushed for the guilt our sins deserved. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed." We all have gone astray like sheep. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has charged all our guilt to him. This is the word of our Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father who loves us so much that he gave up his son for us. And grace and peace to you from God the Son who loves us so much that he gave himself up for us. Dear fellow believers, as we are gathered on another Good Friday, once again at the base of the cross. Good Friday for me has always presented a problem, a paradox, something I can't always wrap my head around. And It is this for me. I hate Good Friday, and I love Good Friday. I hate Good Friday because this is the day where I see my sins laid bare like my Lord on the cross. But I love Good Friday. Because this is the day where we see God's love for us laid bare like our Lord on the cross. Good Friday presents a lot of contradictions, a lot of paradoxes just like that. Just think back to what happened on that first Good Friday. The sun stopped shining at noon and didn't shine again for three hours. There was such a violent earthquake that the rocks are split, graves are opened, and some of the dead even come back 
to life. It seems as if the whole universe was out of control, but in the midst of all of that, our Lord still has complete control. More paradoxes. Our text from Isaiah tells us why there is this seeming confusion and these contradictions and these paradoxes. Because you and I know that everything was created on God's word. In Genesis, we're told, God said, and it happened. In Isaiah 53 here, the words that God says to us, it doesn't sound right. It's not how things should be. More paradoxes. But what would you expect? What would you expect from this particular crucifixion? What would you expect from a crucifixion that begins with someone asking for forgiveness for the people who are nailing him to a cross? It is on that cross where God's love for sinners and his hatred for sinners meets. It is on that cross where God's love, his mercy, his justice all comes together. It is where we see tonight God's divine paradox. Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, We all have gone astray like sheep. Each of us has turned to his own way. It would be nice if we could say that the troubles that we have aren't really our own. Maybe some of us try to blame others for the sins that we do. Maybe we try to follow what our first parents did in the Garden of Eden, and they tried to blame a tempter for their sin. Maybe some of us try to say that at least we're not that bad compared to other people. At least we're not that bad compared to someone who is a murderer, someone who is in prison. Or maybe we try to wash our sins away, kind of brush them aside by saying, it's not really our fault because of whoever. Well, what, what does Isaiah say here? We are the sheep that love to wander. We all have gone astray. We have no one else to blame for our sins except us. Our Lord laid out for us what we are to do. It's called the Ten Commandments. And what have we done? Each and every turn we go any other way except the way that he laid out for us. We think we can find some better way than what he has said in his word. We are not innocent victims of anyone. We chose to sin. We chose to wander. We chose to go astray. So then we have earned for ourselves what Isaiah paints for us. We earned these sufferings, sorrows, being stricken, smitten, and afflicted. What does the scripture tell us? The wages of sin is death. 
that is how things are supposed to be. But what happens on Good Friday? Something unexpected. A paradox. On that confused and disordered day when the sun stopped shining at noon, what happened? God does not punish the sinners, but he punishes the sinless. Jesus gives up everything to give us everything. On that Good Friday, nature itself was in upheaval because there's an upheaval going on in God's divine courtroom. The innocent is suffering for the guilty. God himself, the Son of God, is shedding his blood for sins committed against him. The creator dies for his creatures Jesus gives up his spirit to give us life. Does any of that make sense? Does any of that make sense on how it is supposed to be? You and I know that the person who commits the crime should get the punishment. We know that not only from our common sense, we know that also from Scripture. We're told in Ezekiel, the soul who sins is the one who will die. What do we have on Good Friday? It's not the soul who sins that dies. It is the one person, the only person who has never sinned that dies. All the things that Isaiah said for us, all those punishments, all those sorrows, all those sufferings, being stricken, smitten, and afflicted, being crushed, being pierced, all those things, they are hard enough to bear if you deserve them. How about for the one person who did? They were a burden so heavy. Remember that he even prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if this can pass, let it pass. It is a burden that is so heavy. While he is on the cross, even though he knows the answer, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It makes absolutely no sense, does it? Why would Jesus, why would the Son of God, why would God himself do all of this, suffer all of this, for you and for me. The answer. He wanted to. This is what he wanted to do to save us. This is what he wanted to do to make you and me his own. And that is when this paradox starts to make a little more sense for us. For this is the only way that God's hatred for sinners and God's love for sinners can mesh. Only in the cross can God justice for every single sin committed? Can that be meshed with God's mercy for each and every sinner? Only in the cross, only in Jesus suffering our punishment, 
could we be freed from the guilt of all of those sins? And now, now something unheard of is possible for you and me. Full and complete forgiveness for each and every sin. We get to be God's children. We get to have that blessed hope of an eternal life because of our Lord's death. That we would go astray, that was sadly too predictable. That the Son of God would make full payment for all of our sins, no wonder even nature was turned upside down on that Good Friday. When such a momentous upheaval is happening in heaven, how could there not be signs of it on the earth below? How could the rocks not shake and split? How could the tombs not cough up their dead? How could the sun continue to shine in the sky as if nothing was happening on the earth below? God's divine paradox was on that cross for you and for me. How could Isaiah have written any other words except the words of Isaiah 53, verse 6? The words that changed our lives forever. The words that opened heaven for you and for me the words that sum up this divine paradox. We all have gone astray like sheep. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has charged all our guilt to him. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, we will continue with the offering. We will continue with the, the, the prayers printed for us, starting at the bottom of page 9, continuing for the next few pages. Let's pray. Let us pray for the whole church, that our gracious Father would defend her from the devil and keep her faithful to her Lord. Almighty and everlasting God, you have revealed your saving name to the world through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Protect us from the assaults of the evil one and help us remain faithful to your word so that in every adversity we may stand firm in our faith and give ourselves fully to our Savior's work. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who serve in the public ministry and for all people of God. Almighty and everlasting God, you rule over all things for the good of your people. Preserve us from, from divisive spirits and false teachers. Give your servants the grace to proclaim Christ joyfully in word and deed, so that all who hear them may come to know their Savior better and be strengthened for their lives of service. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray for those who are being instructed in the word, that they may remain firm in the simple faith of baptism. Almighty and everlasting God, you make us your own dear children by the washing of rebirth and renewal in the Holy Spirit. Give strength to all who are buried with Christ in baptism, that each day they may die to sin and rise again to live new and holy lives through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray for our earthly government, our rulers, and all who are in authority. Almighty and everlasting God, you have established earthly government to keep a measure of order in this dying world and to protect us from, from the disorder of sin. 
Give to all rulers the wisdom to govern well, and to all citizens the desire to obey them, so that we may live peaceful lives in all godliness and holiness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray that our gracious Father would protect us and our communities from the many earthly calamities that threaten us. Almighty and everlasting God, on all sides we are surrounded by danger from wars and famine, from disease and pestilence, with the devil begrudging us every minute of our lives. Protect us from all these miseries, so that your name may still be glorified in them, and so that we may safely pass through them to your heavenly kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who are outside the church, that they may come to know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Almighty and everlasting God, your Son was lifted up on the cross so that he might draw all people to himself. Through the proclamation of your gospel, mercifully gather a people that are your very own, that we may join together around your throne in glory to praise and thank you forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our enemies and for all those who hate us. Almighty and everlasting God, no one can harm us without grieving you, whose name we bear. We ask that you change the hearts of those who work against us and who hate us without reason. Give them repentance and faith so that they may be glad with us and find joy in your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer under cross and trial. Almighty and everlasting God, you sent your Son into the world to bear our grief and to carry our sorrows. Help those who are suffering for your name's sake and who are struggling against temptation, that they may not be overwhelmed with sadness and find relief in your grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Finally, let us pray for all those things for which our Lord would have us ask in the words he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We now continue with our next hymn, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted.
We glory in your cross, O Lord, and we praise your holy resurrection. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and we praise your holy resurrection. Lord, by your cross, joy has come into the world. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and we praise your holy resurrection. For by your cross, joy has come into the world. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. By your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. We conclude this service with O Perfect Life of Love, following the singing of our closing hymn. You may stay as long as you wish, but you're asked to leave in silence. <laughs>